I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you to everybody who's on Facebook Live who's joining us today. Um, I'm very happy to have with us today um, Ms. Crystal Amalong, who is the head and owner of Sprouts Therapy. Um, I'll be doing a quick introduction like usual. So uh, again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Catherine Takeda Wong. I'm a naturopathic physician and ND. And like medical doctors, NDs attend a four-year medical school and are trained as primary care physicians. I order lab tests, write prescriptions, and do school physicals, the same as any other doctor. I'm also a licensed acupuncturist trained in Chinese medicine. Uh, the typical medical school, most people don't realize that the typical medical school for medical doctors offers about 19.6 hours of nutrition uh, training. Uh, whereas by contrast, naturopathic doctors receive 155 hours in nutrition, and we're really trained in the power of nutrition to build health from the inside. In addition, I use vitamins, healing herbs, and other natural medicines to deal with the underlying causes of disease and treat the whole person. Doing things that way takes a lot more time than prescribing pills, and so for that reason, my office visits are a full hour. Now, as our talk today progresses, if you have any health concerns that you would like to talk with me about, please call our office to schedule a no-charge phone consultation called, which we call the Personal Health Strategy Session. This is a time when you can talk with me personally about any health concerns that you have, and we come up with a plan to see how I can help you the most. And that way, we both have a better idea of what needs to be achieved. Our number is 808-425-2987, and you'll find all of our contact information here on our Facebook page. So as I mentioned, today I have the pleasure of talking with Crystal Ong, the owner and director of Sprouts Therapy. Sprouts Therapy is a clinic which provides occupational therapy, physical therapy, feeding therapy, and speech therapy, primarily for children with special needs. Crystal is also a pediatric occupational therapist herself. I referred many of my patients with special needs to Sprouts and I found their work to be exceptional. But rather than have me try to explain what they do, let me introduce to you Crystal and have her talk about the clinic and give you an overview of their approach to treating children with special needs. So again, Crystal, thank you so much for joining us. Really happy to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, and then can you just tell us a little bit about your own background and training briefly? Oh, yeah. Um, so I was born and raised in Colorado. And so I graduated uh, with a degree in occupational therapy from Colorado State University. Um, let's see, that was back in 2002. 2002. Um, and so since then, and since in, in the field of occupational therapy, you can go into many different areas of practice. So I focus primarily in pediatrics ever since graduating. And I have a special interest in learning more about children with um, on the autism spectrum, but and also children with sensory processing disorders and really focusing in on um, all of the different things that kiddos can do to help with self-regulation skill development. So that's kind of my background and my interest area. That's where I really love to work. Nice. And and what got you into this field in the first place? Yeah, I don't really have like a family member or anything like that that brought me into the field. I just, um, I think I just always really liked working with kids. Growing up, I was a figure skater. And when I was getting into the high school and college years, I started teaching, you know, kiddos how to skate and the coaches started realizing that I could kind of get all the kids to up and get up and move and start marching around and doing all this stuff so they started having me teach all of the two and three year olds <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and so I just started um, realizing that I did have a gift for teaching kids and then um, I, gra I kind of gradually got into teaching special needs kids how to skate so I've been working with special needs kids from high school and college until today. So it's just been always just an area that I really um, enjoyed and I found that I was able to help and contribute to. So that's kind of what got me into it. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's really cool to hear people's like background story, you know? 
know, what, yeah. what got them into things. So, um, and then I know that your clinic offers physical therapy, occupational therapy, feeding therapy, and speech therapy. Um, so let's take each one and then talk about an example of what a child might be doing in therapy and how that therapy could help each child or help that child uh -huh. in, in a hypothetical example. Uh, so let's start with occupational therapy. Okay, yeah, um, occupational therapy or OT is probably a great one to start with because it's mo the most confused. People don't necessarily know what occupational therapy is. So think about the word occupation as what a person does every single day. And our therapy is what we want need to do or can do to help them be able to perform those daily occupations. For a child, it is primarily play. Children always, um, you know, are engaging in some sort of play activities as they grow up. And for a lot of our kiddos that are either on the spectrum or have attention deficits or sensory processing disorders, they don't naturally learn how to play or engage in play in the same way as neurotypical kiddos do because um, there's something that's inhibiting that experience for them. So occupational therapists really get a focus in on the play element. That's sort of why I'm here sitting in my gym, um, mm -hmm. which is full of obviously a lot of different play activities that we do with our kiddos. To an outsider looking in, it would look like, you know, you're just kind of at a regular kid's gym engaging with kiddos, but there's always some sort of clinical reasoning going on in an occupational therapist's brain of what kind of movement we're doing and what kind of activities we're doing so that we can help that child grow in the, the, those areas that they're missing. Um, so I'll just give an example for occupational therapy. There is a swing here on my right. Um, so this swing is called a platform swing. You, we use it all the time in occupational therapy. Um, and you can imagine that with different types of movement, you can change a child's arousal. So you can help a child become more alert. Um, let's say your child is really lethargic all the time and their head's on the table and they're moving like a slot and you really need them to get up and going and attend and make eye contact to be able to learn or to be able to play. You may want to use a swing like this with that child and, and give them a more circular kind of an input with it. So you're playing with them in a more circular kind of a motion in both directions. And that circular motion is alerting to their vestibular system. Mm -hmm. So an occupational therapist might use this swing to help increase their arousal levels, um, to help them be more alert and then to help them play or learn. Or, you know, you might have another child who is, um, maybe overly excited all the time and having a hard time sitting still and having a hard time focusing. So you may use the swing like this in that scenario to provide a linear, which is kind of a rocking motion of input, sort of like you're rocking a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is more of a calming input to their vestibular systems. And that then can help them come back down to a more regulated state so they're more in the here and now with you and then able to play a limit. So that's just one way out of many different things we do on these types of swings that you can see what an occupational therapist is attending to when they're using a piece of equipment like that. Yeah, and I think there's just, there's clearly like there's so much that's underneath the surface, you know, of what's yeah. going on with these children because we know that their, you know, their sensory system, their ability to sense input from the world is their, their interpretation of that, of those senses are often not quite normal. And um, so I guess, would it be correct to say that like through helping to use these different types of movements and, and play therapies, you help to regulate some of their different systems, which then helps to regulate their behavior or some of their other kinds of things that, that they have challenges with in special needs. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the end, the end game or the functional change that you're looking to see is really that ability to attend or calm down or learn or be, you know, increase eye contact, um, interpret things that are going on in their environments and all of that is happening as a result of this kind of input that we're getting. Yeah. And then um, 
let's let's go on to feeding therapy because I think that uh, feeding therapy is something that is there, there's really not much awareness about it and how it can help, especially children with special needs. So, um, yeah. could you talk a little bit about that and um, some of the differences that you that you've seen? with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that a lot of our referrals for feeding therapy come um, because parents are noticing that their kiddos, kiddos are picky eaters, right? Mm -hmm. And so then it's a matter of kind of, you know, weeding through those picky eaters and figuring out are, are some of these just, you know, typical kiddos that are going through um, the natural phases that kids go through as they're learning about new foods, or is there really some underlying skills that are missing that is inhibiting their ability to learn how to eat or feed? So we work with those kiddos. Um, occupational therapists and speech therapists both work with feeding kids. They both kind of focus on different areas. The occupational therapist focuses on the sensory elements to feeding and the postural requirements that are necessary to eat. So they're going to be looking at how is the child sitting in their chair? What positions are they? Is the child working so hard to be in their chair that they can't they don't have any leftover energy or muscle supply to be able to eat and focus on those motor skills because they're trying, they're sliding out of their chair the whole time. Um, in terms of the picky um, eating and the sensory side of things, they um, are going to use food as their equipment. So let's say um, little Johnny isn't able. Every time mommy puts you know a certain food in front of him at the, uh, at the table. Johnny's looking the other way and his whole body's over here. Well, Johnny's basically telling us that he's not visually able to tolerate seeing that food right now. Mm -hmm. So what an occupational therapist is going to do is work on him being able to visually tolerate that food, not on eating that food. So think of eating that food is really up here and then visually tolerating it is more down here. And then the occupational therapist will help Johnny move through different sensory systems with that food. So he'll eventually learn how to play with it and then touch it and then put it on his cheeks and eventually getting it into his mouth to taste it and then eat it. So there's a whole process um, that is really built from tolerating it for, through each sensory system. And then, um, you know, the, the speech therapist is really going to be looking at the oral motor movements of the mouth. And can that child use the mouth um, in a way to move the food, create the bolus, and swallow it? Mm -hmm. So they may use things like licorice and stick that licorice in, in the mouth and pretend like you're brushing your teeth with it or a celery stick or anything like that to maybe elicit the tongue to do a reflex that swipes it all the way back to the back molars. Well, that tongue swipe is needed to help us move our food in our mouth. So if a child's not doing that, then we can use these foods to help elicit those kind of oral motor movements and then make gains in learning how to eat. So both the sensory side of, it, of the picky eating and the oral motor sides are addressed in our eating therapy sessions. Yeah, and this, this kind of goes back to, I guess, a more basic kind of thing, but when we're talking, because not everyone may know what we're talking about when we say sensory. So um, yeah. so basically the input we get from our, our five senses, so things that we see, things that we hear, things that we feel, um, and then our sense of smell. And then also um, I know there's uh, the sense of, you know, taste, of course. Um, and I know that a lot of children with autism tend to be extremely picky eaters, you know, where they they only like crunchy things or they won't touch anything that's mushy and things like that. So, um, yeah, how have you seen uh, feeding therapy help some of these children who are picky eaters? Or <laughs> well, extremely picky eaters? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, feeding therapy is a process. It's not, well, you know, you're not in here one day and then you're out. It's a process of moving food through the developmental milestones of eating and it's a process of moving through different types of foods including different colors of food and different textures of food and all of that so it's 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 a process and, it, and you do need to be um you know ready to go through the entire therapy program in order to see great changes and when you do you will you will see that your list of foods that your child you know, will eat for you 
gradually grows and grows and grows and grows. So you can see really great changes to parents and families that are dedicated to the group. Yeah, nice. And then uh, let's let's touch on physical therapy because um, I think physical therapy might be obvious to people if, say, a child has a physical disability, like they're in a wheelchair or um, they have other kinds of movement disabilities or things like that. But um, I think a lot of parents are not familiar with how children with special needs who don't have a physical disability can also benefit from physical therapy. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you're right. I think that a lot of kiddos who maybe wouldn't qualify for phys physical therapy maybe in the school district because they can access their environments there um, still may benefit from outpatient physical therapy to address some other um, more subtle concerns in their um, in their ability to access their environment. So um, access PE, um, access the playground, all these different things that kiddos do. So I, I can, you can see on my other side here, there's a balance before, right? So you may imagine that a child could just run across that balance beam and not fall off and hit the floor and, and or touch the floor when they're crossing. And you may think, well, my kiddo can cross the balance beam, no problem. But what a physical therapist may be doing is assessing how and the quality in which they're crossing that balance beam. And if you ask that child to slow down and walk across the balance beam, you may see that they aren't able to take more than one or two steps before losing their balance. And so there's an underlying balance deficit that's hidden that's not really being addressed. And because the child is getting by with their physical skills, by using momentum. So the, the, the momentum of running across that balance beam as fast as they can is, is making it look like I can do this no problem. But when you ask them to slow down and do a static position, it's actually very hard. And then when you ask them to slow down even more and just stand on the mat on one foot and balance on one foot, you'll see that that's really hard too. So there's usually some underlying physical um, or gross motor deficits going on that can be addressed in PT for a lot of our kiddos that come here for the other services that we'll usually refer to after after they come in through the door because of a speech referral or an OT referral. Mm -hmm. And what are some differences that you've seen? I mean, I know, of course, that, you know, with all of these therapies, it's not, you know, instantaneous or overnight. Um, but what are some differences that you've seen with a child going through say physical therapy or occupational therapy um, after you know they've worked with you for a good mm -hmm. amount of time and gone through a therapy program? I mean, th going through a therapy program can be really life-changing for families in different ways. Everybody has their own experience, mm -hmm. right? But you can imagine a media child that has been um, avoiding for one reason or another um, any sort of engagement in PE classes or um, or playground activities and so then they're in isolation because mm -hmm. they realize that this is too hard for them but yeah. nobody knows why you know and so when you do get to address the underlying deficits whether that be a a, post a sensory based motor problem like a postural disorder or a gross motor disorder or whatever's going on it then provides a sense to that child that they can do right mm -hmm. and once they think that they can do then they start to be able to engage and then there's their social mo um, social emotional um uh, well-being improves and so it turns into this whole cycle where you just help them with one little thing and then you'll start seeing oh they're they're learning more they're engaging more their social interactions are better their gross motor skills are improving they're participating in school they're getting nice reports from the teachers now all because you just help them with some of the underlying things that were going on that nobody else really knew were going on mm -hmm. yeah and I've seen um, you guys have other therapies too that work with attention and focus. And I've, you know, I've seen, I referred some children with ADHD to you guys where I've seen their focus and attention improve. I've seen children with autism where their behavior improves, their um, ability to speak, their behavior, you know, improves yeah. and their, uh, their picky eating, all those kinds of things I've seen 
improvements, yeah. you know, with what you guys do. And then we'll um, touch really briefly on speech therapy. I think that's, um, I think, obvious to most people. But, you know, could you just talk briefly about the speech therapy that you guys provide? Yeah, I mean, the speech therapists here are using the same, all this equipment that I've already kind of, see, that you see in the background and that I'm showing you. But if you can imagine that a child is intrinsically motivated to engage when they're in this kind of environment. Right. Yeah. So the more the more that they want to climb or they want to get up and they need your help, then they're they're engaging every time in building this rapport between therapist and child and that rapport and needing each other to communicate so that we can get on the slides and get on the trip, to get on the zip lines provides endless opportunities to communicate. And the more they want to communicate, the more you're able to target in on their speech skills. So it's just an ideal environment for reciprocal communication, whether it's an articulation issue that you're working on or a language you know, issue. It's just, it's really valuable to have movement-based speech programs. Yeah, and I think that's something that's really different that you guys provide is, you know, because I, I actually did my bachelor's degree in speech pathology and I worked as a as a speech aide um, because I knew I wanted to help children with special needs. And then for me, as I learned more about the medical aspects of autism, that's how I got more into like the medical side of things. But um, I worked as a speech aide in DOE and it was typically in, uh, you know, a classroom or just like a, a small room where you're, they're closed, you know, and they're, you're sitting at a table and then you're working on worksheets or flashcards, um, which is fine. But I mean, it's, you know, if you can do it in a more natural environment and engage in communication and involve it in a play-based way, I think that it's, it's just so much more fun for the child. And they're more likely to be engaged and motivated because that was some of the things that I just observed, with, you know, was sometimes challenging was to keep the kids motivated or engaged when they're sitting in this, like small classroom and there's like no windows and you're working on a worksheet or a flashcard, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's important to be able to kind of do both. And some of the kiddos, you know, they really do, you know, need to hone in on some specialized skills and then they can do more, you know, smaller skills in some of our smaller rooms, but there's a lot of kiddos that would struggle with that. And so that's what yeah. this room and these rooms are built for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, and then we'll we'll get back to our talk with Crystal Amalong from Sprouts Therapy in just a moment. But uh, before we go on, I just wanted to pause to remind those of you who are joining us that we do offer a no charge phone consultation. Um, if you would like to talk with me personally um, about any of um, the medical things, we'll kind of touch on that a little bit. Um, but it is our phone consultation called the Personal Health Strategy Session, where you can talk with me about any health concerns that you may have and about how to feel empowered with your health. So um, if you would like to talk with me, you can just call our office at 808-425-2987, and you'll find the information here on our Facebook page as well. Uh, so getting back with Crystal, um, I've noticed that your clinic offers a lot of cutting edge therapies that really aren't offered at, at some other clinics here in Hawaii. Um, so what should parents look for in choosing high quality services? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, you know, a lot of different things you could be looking for depending on the different concerns that you have with your kiddo. Um, so you know, you might be looking for a certain approach to therapy, whether that be a child-led play-based approach, um, sometimes that's called floor time, whether that be a movement-based opportunities because you know your child's on the go all the time and going to have a hard time sitting at a table. Um, what I would tell parents in terms of when or what to look for is you just want to find a place that makes your mommy or daddy gut feel good. Mm -hmm. And so as a parent, I just know if I'm bringing my child to a place where that's making my gut, my mom feelings feel good inside, yeah. and then I feel sick. And if you're, if you are questioning that, I just say, trust it. And then if you, you know, and, and, and then ask questions and advocate and say, you know, these are my concerns and what can we do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether that be here at Sprouts and let, let make sure we address it or anywhere else that you go, you just follow that mommy intuition or that daddy intuition and look for the things that you feel like your child is telling you. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, I would say you want your child to, to enjoy it, to yeah. be coming, mm -hmm. having a good time. 
yeah. and um, want to be participating. Even kiddos that are having a hard time here, which we do have kids that have a hard time, that's our goal is to get them to that place and work as a team so that we can get them to that place. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that uh, that parents and that we as providers of children with special needs all recognize that it really takes a village to raise and help our special needs children. Uh, you know, and I refer patients to Sprouts Therapy because I've seen how much how much our therapies help children with special needs, and um, also just the feedback I've gotten from parents. I've I've literally never heard anything negative ever about you guys. I've always just heard parents really just sing your praises. So um, that's a big reason why I refer patients to you guys, um, and that you guys provide services that I can't. You know. Um, in terms of my aspect is with medical side of things. And um, I know that there are times when you refer children to see me as, as well for medical evaluation. So uh, just based on your clinical experience, what do you want parents and providers to know about when, when a child should be referred for medical evaluation? Well, in terms of when to refer for a medical evaluation, I think people should just know that everybody could benefit from it. I mean, I myself went underwent a uh, medical evaluation with Dr. Keta and, um, and so did my daughter and we, you know, we're not a special needs family, but anybody can benefit from it. And you can learn so much about your own body or your child's body and different ways that you can make things better, whether or not they're a special needs challenge or just a regular mommy and daddy parenting <laughs> challenge that you're going through or your own health. So um, when you definitely would want to refer is when you're, I think, dealing with more behaviors, um, when there are challenges that your team are, are not able to pinpoint when you're, when you hit a wall and you're like, we've tried the OT thing. We've tried the sensory thing. We've tried the regulation component and we're still challenged. There's something else going on here. Then you really want to make sure that you're getting the referral um, because Dr. Dakeda's office can provide you with so much more information about what's going on internally with your child that Sprouts would never be able to see or test for. So working together in that, that dual refer referral is just really an optimal thing so that we can help in, in our specialty, but the medical evaluations of Dr. Dakota Wong's um, evaluations are really necessary to learn more. And then we are addressing the whole child. Yeah, and I've seen some children, like for example, a lot of parents don't realize that if a child has a lot of aggress aggressive behavior or self-injurious behavior where they're biting their arms or they're hitting their head all the time. Um, and this is this is from a, a pediatric Harvard trained Harvard gastroenterologist, um, Dr. Tim Bowie. He published a paper in pediatrics that talked about how that uh, those aggressive behaviors, particularly in children with autism, could actually be an under a sign of pain of um, some kind of inflammation, particularly like acid reflux or inflammation in the gut. And um, so I've seen that, you know, when we address those kinds of things with children, a lot of times there's their behavior will get better. And sometimes it's really challenging to work with a child, you know, in your in your clinic when they're extremely aggressive and they could be a danger to the therapist or to other children around them. Um, or, you know, and, and just in their day-to-day -day life, right? To themselves or if they're injuring themselves or to their parents or other kids. Um, and and so I think, you know, like addressing those kinds of things. Um, I've often, parents have often said, oh, you know, now that like we, or they might have food allergies or other kinds of issues that are causing problems for them. And then as we take those foods out or they, we address, we decrease inflammation, they're, they're better able to attend to the therapies that you guys are doing. They're better able to learn, you know, and, um, and I, I tell parents, I was like, but, you know, you really need to work with therapies, like with Sprouts Therapy, because, you know, I'm here to kind of try to clear out some of the, the medical roadblocks that could be causing some of these issues or contributing to some of the issues with children. But um, and, and there can be medical issues related to them dif to difficulty with communication, like because their brain isn't working better. They may not they might have nutrient deficiencies or other things like that. But then I tell parents, uh, you know, that's my job. But then Sprouts Therapy, they're the ones that are working with you guys like day in and day out to really help your child kind of catch up if they're delayed or they're behind 
to help them to gain these skills, to regulate themselves, um, to learn, to be able to communicate or recognize emotions. And um, I've just seen when they're doing both that these children just get so much better, you know, because they're doing the daily, weekly, you know, regular therapies with you guys to help regulate all of these in their sensory system, help them with their behaviors and their communication, all of that. Um, and I know that part, some of the things that you guys work with too are like, especially children with autism, helping them to recognize emotions, right? Like in, in themselves, learning to recognize facial expressions and it, it recognize facial expressions in others. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot. I mean, I know you guys, you could talk for a whole day on the therapies that you guys do. There's a lot that you guys do. Um, and um, and I guess if you could just share, uh, lastly, any um, observations about how uh, like appropriate medical treatment and that combination with the medical care and what you guys do, um, could you share, uh, you know, just some, uh, I guess a quick example or a case of maybe a child that, that you saw that, you know, how that helped them? Oh yeah, um, well, I mean, first of all, I think having Dr. Piketa on board with any sort of feeding cases is really valuable. Um, th those cases are really important because you can imagine we're, all, we're doing feeding therapy with different types of foods. And what if one of those foods was actually a food that the child had an allergy to or intolerance to? You know, so it'd be really an ideal situation to always have um, Dr. Piketa in a medical evaluation going on with all of our feeding kiddos because then we would know we're not helping this kid tolerate a food, a food that they shouldn't have, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's really important. Um, and I guess in terms of the other examples, there's just so many, but a lot of decreased ag ag aggression, like you said, um, and increased ability to attend um, to us or to learning. Um, the, the, those kiddos that had self-injurious behaviors, those significantly decreased Recently, there was a kiddo that was kind of slamming into the walls, and that behavior completely went away after his medical evaluation. So um, there's a lot of great changes that can come from a dual approach between the medical evaluation and the throat therapy services, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, and I know that we, um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that we work collaboratively is just that, like I said, I think, you know, we really recognize that uh, that it really takes a village to help our children. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you, and we'll um, we'll wrap up here. So, I, uh, you know, for our viewers, I trust our discussion has been useful for you. Um, if you would like to talk to Sprouts Therapy about their services, please call them. Eight zero eight two six zero nine zero five six is their phone number. They're on the web at SproutsTherapy.com. Um, and then we'll put a link also in our post um, to them so that you can, to their website, so you can learn more uh, about all the great services that they offer. I highly recommend them. And I honestly feel like you guys are really like the, the top, you know, clinic that I recommend, uh, especially for occupational therapy, but just with other things. I mean, it's, um, I've, I've just you know, I just, I kind of just go by parent feedback. And again, I've had parents just really rave about your guys' services um, and just all the cutting edge therapies that you, that you provide that aren't available at other clinics. So uh, thank you, you know, so much for all that you guys do. Um, yeah. And then um, again, if, uh, you know, any of you guys are interested in talking with me about any health concerns, um, again, we have our, our personal health strategy session um, about how you can talk with me and how to feel empowered about your health to arrange and just call our office and ask to be scheduled for your free consult. Um, you can also text our office at 808-425-2987. You'll find all of our contact information right here on our Facebook page. And you can just click on the contact button. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, really look forward to Seeing you in two weeks again for our next Facebook Live. Aloha.